Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And um, let me just start and be really honest. I'm a geek. Okay, that's what PhD means. I'm a geek. At some point, said to me, "You can't do geekery anymore. You've got to do business." So I now do business with geeks. <laughs> um, it's really great to be back here at an in-person conference, I'm sure you'll agree. And well done, Drew, uh, for that, and for coping with a sudden and rather late change in venue. As you know, the title that I saw was Survive and Thrive. And this pretty much summarises the everyday story of science park folk. Normal people who take the merest glowing ember of an idea, fan the flame and turn it into a world-beating company with great science-based products and services that change our world. So I'm here to talk about science, entrepreneurship, how we take the risk and make money from it, and economic growth, what it does for all of us. Science, they say, is a story told in chapters, and I know there's nothing quite like double science on a Friday afternoon <laughs> for quickening the pulse. But I prefer to think that science is the story of the curious, creative, playful, enthusiastic, and persistent men and women who want to know how the world works and how they might change it. Following the last presenta presentation, I've had to bring a support team with me. So I've brought with me a 16th century astronomer, a Nobel Prize winner, you've got to have one of those, the most beautiful woman in the world, and the son of a Morton Hampstead stonemason. Here in the graveyard slot, just after lunch, I will also be talking about the Valley of Death <laughs> and how to cross it. Finally, I'm going to give you a vision of Exeter Science Park and how we're planning to add some £150 million of value into our local economy year on year when we're fully built out. No pictures of any interest here. <laughs> but I'm going to start by telling you a short story about the global positioning system, or GPS. The subject of my PhD nearly 40 years ago and the technology that puts the little red circle on the map in your phone. This is an artist's impression of a GPS satellite big as a bus, travelling at five kilometres per second, around about 20,000 kilometres above the Earth's surface, with the power output of a household incandescent light bulb. Frankly, it's a miracle that we can receive anything at all, let alone use it to navigate and tell the time. The space race started in 1957 with Sputnik, the first positioning system deployed in the mid-60s, and in 1973, a group of engineers and scientists got together and imagined GPS. The first constellation was launched by 1985, just in time for me to do a PhD, which was very good of them, and full operational capability was declared in 1995. The downside for those of us who are scientists is that GPS is conceptually very straightforward. Range measurements from a receiver to four satellites allow us to determine the latitude, the longitude, the height and the time with what is essentially A-level mathematics. But the science 
is extraordinary. And here are my three support artists. Kepler, Johannes Kepler, and his laws of planetary motion underpin the orbital mechanics of GPS. Albert Einstein's general and special relativity is needed to collect, connect for the motion of the satellite clocks. Without that, we'd be 10 kilometers or more off per day. And Hedy Lamarr was promoted by Louis B. B. Mayer when she arrived in Hollywood in 1938 as the most beautiful woman in the world. He might have had another reason for that. However, she invented spread spectrum coding and frequency hopping. What is that? If you think about a Morse code, dit, 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 da, 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 and you just do it on a single note, she said, why not use the whole 88 notes on the piano keyboard? And if I know what the tune is that I'm playing and the person at the other end does, I can avoid my message being jammed or spoofed or interfered with. And that underpins GPS's signal design, as well as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. I could go on to talk about atmospheric physics, all the mathematics and the digital signal processing, but that would be gratuitous. <laughs> GPS has, however, been a magnet for entrepreneurs. Products and services have revolutionized downstream markets, your phones, precision farming, safer flying, offshore exploration. But the timing capability, better than 30 nanoseconds, underpins financial transactions, power and telephony. Broadcom are the people that make the chips inside your mobile phone. They've done pretty well out of it. And in terms of economic growth, 1.4 trillion dollars is what GPS has added to the US private sector economy between 1984 and 2017. And it's estimated that it would cost a billion dollars a day to their economy if GPS was taken away. That shows what's possible. However, just in case you thought we were having too much fun in science's sunny uplands, now is the time to visit the Valley of Death. This is a 1982 film. Um, it's a divorced mother, her young son, and a new boyfriend set out on a road trip and run afoul of a local serial killer, 28% on Rotten Tomatoes, I'll let you make that decision. <laughs> but this is about how we develop technology. And we have these funny things called technology readiness that takes us from academic research at the left-hand side to industry at the right-hand side. But this bit in the middle is the valley of death. It's the bit that entrepreneurs and startups look at. They try and work their way through. The challenges, the regulatory challenges, how do they get the, is, you know, is there a regulation that they have to overcome? Financial, how to fund the growth, pay for the people, the kit, the space, without running out of money, how to execute quickly. A complex world of grants and debt and equity with angel investors, venture capitalists, bankers who are trying to get you, and shareholders. Operationally, the leadership and cultural challenges of moving from research to executing an operationally intensive company, products and services, and the marketing. Yes, you have to have this but it's not often always appreciated. And this is what we do in science parks. We help these innovative science-based companies 
deliver extraordinary growth. And over the last five years, some people would imagine that I'd been living the dream, turning around and developing a startup science park, getting it to break even. When I started my first day in the role, my chair at the time said, bad news, Sally, just lost 1.7 million pounds of match funding. Can you go and find some? <laughs> day 30, uh, the chief exec of the LEP said to me, unless you get me a business case for five and a half million by May, you're going to lose the grant. That was my starting point, and then I looked at the cash and thought, this is worse than the business plan told me. But what do we do? We, first of all, produce um, the buildings and a flexible way for people to come in and start their companies up with laboratories and offices and other space. This building right at the bottom is the George Parker Bidder building. He's my Morton Hampstead stonemason's son. He was known as the calculating boy. And he was one of these people who at age six was able to do all that mental arithmetic. He's supposed to be about the second best ever. He was shown at fairs, he did sums for the Queen Victoria and all of those sort of things. And he was eventually picked out um, by a, a sort of well-to-do individual and they took him and said, look, we're going to pay your father off so you no longer have to go to the fairs. We'll send you to university, which he went to. And then he got involved after the Ordnance Survey and did all the railways in the UK and Norway and Belgium, various other places. He did the Queen Victoria docks in London. He did the first telegraphy and even did the first steam trains uh, sorry, steam trawlers out of the, um, out of Paynton. He was quite a star. He was the president of the Institute of Civil Engineers and he eventually died in Dartmouth. But it's such a great social story. We work with Set Squared in Exeter to develop and mentor the companies and help them to grow and get funds in. And we network people to um, finance, to all the sort of different parts of the ecosystem that they need to build their company. And the proof of the pudding is in the growth. Many who started on their park in 2016, three people, they were then acquired by Dell, became Dell Boomi, 40 people um, at site, global reach now, and since then have been demerged and are going on to their next, um, their next success, for example. So what about the future? Well, today, before I go that, we're currently contributing around about £27 million gross value add in terms of the jobs into our local economy. What about the future? Looking to 2035 when we're built out, nearly two million people will live within a one hour's drive of Exeter Science Park. There will be over 400 bookable electric vehicle charging points. And I was saying at lunch, the big challenge for that is actually the cost of the transformers and the fact that it costs me 12 grand a year just to turn the transformer on on, those are standing charges, on top of the 150,000 or so that it's cost me to put the transformer in. Nearly 50% of the 3,500 people, we hope, will be regularly using our electric cycle facilities. We'll have highly resilient 100 gigabit broadband. More importantly, we'll be an anchor an economic anchor for our region. Capital development programmes will have contributed some £200 million into our economy. With a combined annual turnover of greater than £300 million in today's world, we will be adding around £150 million of gross value add in terms of jobs again into our local economy. 
That is the strength of a science park. But we will also be contributing to skills pipelines, helping young people um, um, get uh, inspired and take things forward. We will have to be an, an example of sustainability. We're already producing net zero carbon buildings on our site. We will have to be doing more than that, enhancing the natural resilience, improving our biodiversity, and preparing to respond to a warmer world. We'll be finally needing to inspire and wanting to inspire young people to um, choose STEM-based options at school, to stay in our region, to enrich our economy, and to benefit from careers rather than just jobs. An opportunity for them to be here and get as good a career here as you can get anywhere else in the UK or further afield. Those are the sort of things that we're wanting to do. And finally, we want to create a science city at Junction 29 as a, with a strong identity to bring more organisations to our region for more people to have the jobs to improve the, um, the economy, the knowledge of economy of our region in the long term. So how can you get involved? Well, first of all, come and have a look at what we do. Come and talk to our, our, um, our scientists. You might imagine, you know, 500-odd head of scientists in white coats across the Serengeti, that sort of thing. Um, but this is a team game. And we need to build teams with people from the professional services background, people who can present, people can do all sorts of things. Without that, we can't possibly generate what we want. Come and um, work with us to create some of the special interest groups that we're going to need longer term as well. Come and talk to me. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed for your time.